frequency feature, how often users do this, uh, monetary features uh, like uh, how much value you allocate to this feature, for example, uh, more expensive products, less expensive products, or if you know actual value for some micro conversions you have. Uh, categorical features, categorical features like uh, device type, region, uh, screen resolution. So usually we collect one hot encoded. Does anyone know what is one hot encoded? Yeah, so some from the data science field. So actually it means that like if you if you train a neural network, you can just put categories there. If you use some other type like a logistic regression, you cannot just train your model and tell this model like this is iOS, this is uh, this is uh, London. You should encode these features in one, two, three, four, five, for example, iOS is one, Android is two, etc. So this way your model will work. And different permutations. Uh, actually, permutations is like when you multiply one feature to another or give some power to this feature. Because sometimes, for example, if this feature is alone, is like positive factor, but this feature combined with another feature might be negative. For example, if you put a lot of items to your cart, sometimes it's good, but sometimes it's bad because it means that maybe you use your cart as a wish list. Or like, for example, you've put like two two pairs of shoes of the same type to the cart, but of different size. And actually, you put only two items, but you, it, it's a huge intention that you will, would like to buy, but you don't, need, don't know exactly which size you need. So that's why we need different permutations, and of course, normalization. So finally, we have this kind of table. Once we've collected all our raw data and extracted features, we have this kind of table. We have user ID, but usually it's some kind of client, maybe it's cookie ID because a lot of users are not logged in. And we have a lot of features, like we have usually hundreds and thousands of them. And we have a desired label. Label is actually our outcome. So for e-commerce, for example, we usually use like probability to buy in the next seven days. If your decision, if your decisions uh, making cycle is a bit bigger, you can use probability to buy in the next, uh, I don't know, two weeks. So it's up to you to choose your feature. Sometimes you can choose even LTV. Uh, and previously, like to apply this type of machine learning, uh, a lot of work was involved before the big Google BigQuery email. So first you need to collect raw data with some tracker, then you needed to prepare all your features, then you need to prepare a learning set. Once the data is collected, finally you need to download it some, somehow to your computer and train it using Python or R or different Jupyter notebooks. And some uh, more advanced users, of course, upload it somewhere in Google Cloud and launched some servers which also need to be like maintained by uh, so it's actually quite quite complicated because you need to run all this infrastructure and usually it took you like 80 percent of time just to do this machine learning and also it requires advanced knowledge known in python known r and like moving data back and forth and sometimes like you're able to retrain your model only like one two months because otherwise it's an overkill what actually Google BigQuery did? Uh, does, does, does everyone know about Google BigQuery ML? Yeah, good. So what Google BigQuery ML actually did, they simplified the process. So now this part takes only 5% of the time and you don't need to move the data anywhere. You can create your data model right in the Google BigQuery without knowing any, any, anything about Python or R. So how can it be achieved? So first, like, you need to build a model. And what is interesting is that you can build a model just with this simple SQL query. You just write create model, uh, you select uh, model type, in this case it's logistic regression. You select all the features you've just, uh, mined, you've just collected from your website, and you select desired label. For example, you want to predict uh, that user will buy in two weeks, for example. Then you train your model, you see the loss function, you see all the required metrics, you can easily evaluate your model. So it's also just to make a model evaluation and see how accurate this model actually is. You just need to write this simple uh, SQL query as well and uh, Google BigQuery right in the interface will show you all the statistics about the model. I will not stop here because it's mostly for data scientists. But the most important, you, can, you now can know the, the weights of each feature. So previously like, mm, okay, user clicked on all images on the website. Is it really important? So previously you could guess but you didn't know for sure. Right now you can see uh, like the predict predictive power of each feature. So usually we, we select like a lot of micro-conversions. We usually select like thousands of micro-conversions. 
And then the model tells us which microconversion actually matter and which conversions we can just trip out without losing accuracy. So of course it would be overkill to train on a thousand pictures. That's why uh, after one or two months we usually strip out like 80% of unnecessary features which do not have any predictive power. And finally, we have our predictions. So new users come to the website, they have new client ID, they have the same features that we've seen in, in the past, and we can predict in real time the probability to buy for each user. So we store this data, we, we, uh, we predict uh, on a daily basis or even in real time because we have a logistic regression. Actually, logistic regression is just a function, a very simple function of multiplications and summations. So, and we predict probability to buy for each single cookie. For each single cookie, we know the probability of this user to buy in the near future. So how this actually can be used for the attribution, so initial topic of my speech? Very easy. For example, a new user comes to your website, for, for example, from Facebook. And immediately we calculate the probability to buy for this user. For example, 10%. Why is 10%? Why it's not zero? Because this user already has some contextual features like uh, iOS device, this user is from Bucharest, of course, this user has, uh, has bigger probability to buy. Then user clicks, uh, makes some, some navigation on the website, clicks on some menus, uh, views images, so we collect more and more features. And then eventually user leaves the website without a purchase. But still, when, at the point when user leaves the website, this user has another probability to buy because this, we, we collected a lot of more, a lot of new features and we have new probability. Now we see that at the end of the session, user has probability to buy at 25%. So actually, the difference we attribute to Facebook, so actually Facebook pushed the user, uh, pushed the user's probability to buy by 15%. Then two days pass, user uh, goes away somewhere, doing something offline, and then Pretail finally uh, retargets this user and bring back to, the, uh, to, the, to your website. And we can see that in the beginning of the session, user have, has 24% uh, probability to buy. You can see that this probability is lower than it was in, in the end of previous session. It's possible because we also have recent features. When time passes, probability also can change. So user comes at, at 24 probability to buy does some actions and leaves the website again without a purchase. So we can see that uh, at the end of the session, probability to buy is 26%, so Pretail pushed only 2%. So if we, we, if we had used like last non-direct click, we would have attributed like all the value to Pretail, but actually Pretail only pushed 2% in the probability to buy. So we attribute 2% to Pretail. And then we have this table in Google BigQuery, actually. We have a user, and this example is one user, like one cookie. And we have a lot of sessions for this user. Session 1, session 2, session 3. For each session, we can calculate probability to buy in the beginning and probability to buy in the end of the session. And this way, we have attributed delta, like difference between how user push the probability to buy for every session. Then we normalize everything together, uh, like to, to have 100%, and we know the influence of every channel. So this way, you see the complete picture of uh, how user actually where you actually should uh, put money and how actually each channel contributed in pushing user to buy. So, um, what other applications for this methodology can be used? Like, first of all, you can analyze like which users are good and which users are bad, and you can like per cookie basis you can uh, define your bidding strategy in different channels. So, you, like previously, you used segments, for example, like we want users like women aged like 18 to 25, we give this bidding strategy, and this like users will give another bidding strategy. Now you can have a bidding strategy per, on cookie basis. You just de define your positive class threshold for your, for your predictions. For example, you decide that all users that have probability to buy more than 1% are good users. Actually, for e-commerce, those users are good users. And all users that have probability to buy less than 1% are bad users. And you can uh, like send the segments across all the possible uh, channels that you use for retargeting, for example, or for paid search retargeting. This is a, a good example we used with Criteo. We, in the background, we tried to evaluate the influence of each channel. And actually, we see that Criteo, so we didn't send the segments to, to Criteo, but actually, we just in the background, we evaluated how Criteo spends our money. And what we see that like uh, we had a lot of users with high probability to buy, which eventually they actually made the purchase. 
uh, eventually uh, like they made the purchase and we spent like 17% of our budget on these users. But actually we spent almost 82% of budget for users who didn't buy. So actually what can we do here? We can redistribute budget to get more ROI from our retargeting. Another good example with uh, uh, machine learning is that like we have uh, we had a client who had a mistake. We had we have a client uh, we have a client that had a mistake in Google Analytics, and by mistake they forgot to strip out from referrers PayPal. So on the last on the last uh, like checkout mm, final stage, PayPal uh, was redirecting to, to their website to make a payment and then was redirecting back. And with the last known direct click attribution, you can see that PayPal is the second most like. Uh, the second best channel that brought you customers. But actually, it's not true, it's just a mistake in your settings. With ML based attribution, as you can see, almost zero was attributed to PayPal without any additional settings. So, PayPal didn't push anyhow users to the probability, uh, users' probability to buy. Another example you can see here, it's, it's not so visible, but actually, if we strip away PayPal, it would be much, much more because PayPal uh, <laughs> took all, all, all the credits. So we see this promocodes.com. This is some scummy website which gave like uh, fake promo codes on the final on the final stage of uh, user's journey, and users click on these promo codes, and this promo co uh, and was redirected back to the website with like CPA cookie to pay like for affiliate marketing. And we can see that all with last known direct click, some value was attributed to this channel, but with ML-based attribution, almost zero was att was attributed. So I'm finalizing my my speech with uh, like pros and cons of this approach like pros like first you can process hundreds and thousands of different features and micro conversions which is not possible when you do it like like a human being when you define algorithmic approaches second like marketers and analysts and actually business owners can define uh, their own features they would like to use because they they have domain specific knowledge for example for some reason i can decide that like viewing contact page it might be an important feature Let's use this feature for our machine learning as well. And machine learning will, will show you actually it's important or not. Then these predictions are very, very accurate. Models can be retrained every day. So it's, you don't need to move data back and forth. Actually, we retrain our models every day. So it, this way you can adopt for seasonality or you can adopt for UX changes on your website. Also, ability to choose any label. For example, on Google Analytics, you are optimizing only for the online transaction. But actually, we can op op optimize for real sales in our CRM because we have offline data. Or you can optimize for LTV, for example, if you want like getting more and more data from users. And of course, no manual settings required, as I showed in the previous example. You don't need to strip any refers, etc. Cons like first, you need to set up advanced tracking because you need to track all the micro conversions. It's not enough just to, to track page views and UTM parameters. Usually you need four to eight weeks of historical data to train the model to, to, to have kind of cold start. And uh, also it's usually not applicable for websites that have like websites that have like less than 50k of unique users per month. Uh, this is example for e-commerce websites which usually have very low conversion <coughs> rates like 1%. If you have bigger conversion rates, of course you might have less users. And of course, some additional costs might incur due to model training, but usually it's very, very cheap. So even for bigger clients, we usually pay like 30 or 50 dollars for Google BigQuery machine learning. Yeah, so thank you very much. If you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Would you like to explore more about this topic? Where should we start? Uh, first, talk with me during the lunch. Okay. Second, uh, read Google BigQuery uh, ML uh, um, uh, documentation. It's a lot of things there, and also, also you need to understand actually how you will calculate sessions because, like, having raw data and preparing session to understand where is actually session uh, beginning and session end. It also um, so you need to read more about sessions, how you actually can prepare sessions from your kids. Actually, uh, we, we can uh, host this additional discussion about this okay. if you wish in the common area. So. Sure. We will discuss this. Yep. So just a quick question on the user IDs that you presented by the yep. presentation. 
Um, are those user IDs um, you know, tied into the, the Google um, account ID itself? So is there some sort of assistance that's happening there? So you can track beyond that particular session. So you can you know, track across. Yeah, so it's actually cookies. So we use our own cookies, but you can also use Google's client ID easily. So it's some cookies in which which is stick the user uh, between the sessions. So you definitely know that these five sessions belong to the So user. it's not affected by ITP? Huh? Is it affected by ITP? ITP uh, so there are also possibility that it might be affected, but there are lots of solutions how to overcome. You, we, for example, we use local storage or first party cookies. Right. Cookies which are set on HTTP level. So local storage is not that HTTP uh, yeah. HTTP more is... I mean, HTTP, HTTP cookies, which are set on server, so this... this but local storage, local storage does not work. So but uh, server cookies work, yeah. Yeah. so we, we use server cookies as well. Okay. I think it's a good topic to discuss okay. it in the discussion area, so thank you for, thank for you. your uh, good info here. Thank you. Thank you.